Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Republican Media Availability, and thank you for joining us. Uh, with us today on the House side are House Republican Leader J.T. Wilcox from the 2nd District and Representative Andrew Barkas, Ranking Member on the House Transportation Committee, also from the 2nd District. And from the Senate, we have Senate Republican Leader John Braun from the 20th District and Senator Curtis King, Ranking Member on the Senate Transportation Committee and the Senate Labor and Commerce Committee and from the 14th District. Uh, a quick note before we get started, Senator Braun will need to leave right at 9.30 a.m. Uh, this morning, and we understand that the House and Senate Democrats have their media availability at 9.30 a.m., um, so we'll try to be done just before then. Um, with that, I will turn it over to House Republican Leader J.T. Wilcox for some brief opening remarks. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Uh, I uh, hope that uh, you saw the highlights of our budget debate last night. I think it and it's somewhere around 10 o'clock. Um, I'll be very brief because of the time constraints that we have. To me, the there's several highlights. First of all, uh, a very bipartisan budget over the Senate, uh, a less bipartisan budget in the House. Uh, next, um, the failure, I think, of House and Senate Democrats to be willing to address the mistakes of the past when it comes to public safety. And next, uh, surprising and very disappointing uh, I think a uh, battle of ideologies that is somewhat opaque because it's inside Democratic caucuses when it comes to housing, which is one of the several reasons that uh, I asked Andrew Barkas to join us. Uh, and I'll uh, hand it over to uh, the Senate and John Braun now. Uh, thanks, JT. I'll be brief also. I, I would uh, highlight just a couple things. You know, when it comes to public safety, we got two big bills. We're working hard to get out. And I think um, whatever, the, uh, however this lands, I, I'd like to uh, give uh, my colleagues in both uh, the Senate caucus and the House caucus credit for working in a very uh, bipartisan, cooperative manner. We've tr done our best from the minority to offer solutions to these very hard problems having to do with vehicular pursuit uh, and uh, the Blake decision uh, to get us to an answer that helps the state of Washington, even if it's not exactly the right answer, uh, you know, the answer we would pick by ourselves. And if it doesn't make it, I don't think it can be said that we didn't give it our best shot from the minority. On, on affordability, I think you're down to just a few things left. Uh, we had some big housing issues that are coming uh, together now. Uh, taxes are now creeping up as we approach the end of session. Uh, we've seen uh, that the REIT is still in discussion and it shouldn't be. We've also seen an introduction of a new income tax just over the weekend after the recent ruling by the state Supreme Court. And finally, on education, uh, the big issue is our budget. Are we going to stick with the plan to fund a meaningful you know, effort on making up our learning loss? And are we going to really get after properly funding our special education students? So these are the, these are the big issues as we close it out in the last three weeks. I'll stop right there and uh, turn it back over to John Andy. All right. With that, we will get to questions. First, we will go to uh, Jerry Cornfield of the Everett Herald. <clears throat> Good morning. Thank you. Um, first uh, topic I wanted to um, touch on. Uh, today, you may be aware there are two press conferences going on later this morning, early afternoon, dealing with the issue of uh, abortion uh, and, and legislation. One is a new bill relating, as we understand, to protecting access to medical um, medication, abortion medication, and another dealing with data. Uh, wondering what is your interpretation of the Democrats of uh, raising these issues at this stage and what, if any, concerns are you hearing from constituents that want the, this the issue to be resolved and dealt with this session? I think this is, I didn't know about the, the two press conferences, so you got me on that one, Jerry. But what I would say is this has been an effort throughout the session to make this, this the key uh, issue for the session. And frankly, it's fell flat. You know, the rule, the law in the state of Washington has been in place. Since uh, 1970, it was put in place by the people of the state of Washington. Nothing is changing that. No one is suggesting we change it. We do not have an issue with access. We do not have, you know, we don't have an issue with the current law. Uh, it is what it is. And what we hear from our constituents, at least what I hear from folks from around my district and from around the state, is they want to us to deal with public safety. They want us to deal with affordability here in the state of Washington. They want us to deal with education. Uh, and 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 they're they're not really worried about uh, the abortion issue. They know they have spoken, and the law is the law. 
Yeah, I would say uh, no. nobody is threatening uh, the status uh, of that issue in the state of Washington. Uh, Republicans are not bringing it up. Uh, Democrats are. Uh, people are very concerned about lots of other threats, uh, including public safety and, uh, you know, even uh, uh, the lack of access to other kinds of public health in the state of Washington. Jerry, did you have a follow up? Just uh, because I see uh, Representative Barkas and housing, um, I couldn't keep track of what the uh, Senate Ways and Means did in the end with their strikers and changes, but it does feel like the middle housing bill, uh, House Bill 1110, isn't in the same shape it was when it was introduced. And I wondered, can it produce any more housing? What are your what do you what's your critique of where it's at right now? Uh, thanks, Jerry, and good morning. Um, good observation, Jerry. No, that bill is uh, nowhere near what it was when it started. Um, it is a product of time and pressure, right? And uh, as we see with so many policies, but this one, especially uh, all the housing policies, um, as it uh, left committee, I know that there was a striker placed upon it. And a lot of what's in there is addressing the myriad of, of cities, uh, primarily in the Puget Sound region, uh, primarily on the east side of, of, of Seattle, um, who all wanted to have their say in exactly what could be done within that bill. Um, it still has a, a good basis, and um, I do believe that it will produce housing. Uh, if implemented and if it stays uh, the way it is now, and that's uh, there's no guarantee on that either. Um, but, uh, you know, as it plays in with the other housing policies we'll talk about as maybe we go along, um, all of these housing policies have altered uh, tremendously from where they started in a strong position, in a very bipartisan position. Um, and as we end up this session, I will be Lucky if uh, if we see uh, a few of them survive and, and have any meaning to get after our supply issue. Hey, Jerry, I, I think what I would characterize it this way. We offered lots of opportunities uh, to produce housing for the state of Washington via the private sector that wouldn't cost the taxpayer a dime. Most of those have been throttled back or killed. And what we see the governor and others pursuing is billions and billions of dollars uh, of uh, public housing when we could have produced them in the private sector at no cost to taxpayers. It's a good way of putting it. Senator Braun, you'll need to unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, so I would just add, I mean, I agree with Representative Barkas' uh, evaluation of, that, of the middle housing bill. Uh, it's not what it was, but it is it is still meaningful. And I think the most important thing is it's still alive. It has moved out of ways and means. Uh, it's in rules. And I think we have the votes to uh, get it, ultimately get it off the floor of the Senate and get it into negotiations. And I think there's there's still opportunity there. I think that's still true for the ADU bill. It's still true for the um, the transit bill, which is also taking quite a beating. Uh, yeah. It's still true. And it's I think maybe the bill that's in the best shape right now is the permitting bill. So there's still housing bills in play that can make a difference. They're not everything we all first imagined, but that's kind of how the legislative process goes. And I'm I'm still optimistic. Did you have anything else, Jerry? No, I'm good. Thank you. All right. Next, we will go to uh, Laurel Demkovich of the Spokesman Review. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I guess just to follow up on that last question, uh, maybe for Representative Barkas, I think you kind of hinted at this, but can you talk a little bit more about, I guess, how we got here with the middle housing bill? I mean, what some of the sticking points were? I know a number of folks in both of your caucuses were supportive of that. Democrats were obviously supportive of that. So how did we, I guess, get to where we're at with that? Um, sure. You know, and, and I would agree with Senator Braun. I mean, I, this was a, a tremendous amount of policy to tackle in in one session, let alone in a year plus, um, and to try to get it where it's at. Um, I think the biggest concern was there was still this push that said, if we allow uh, middle housing throughout in its entirety, you're going to see uh, neighborhoods alter. You're going to see single family homes replaced with duplexes, fourplexes, sixplexes. 
And I think that's one of the key reasons why one of the uh, key bills, in my opinion, obviously, because I uh, was the centerpiece, was the lot split bill um, didn't move, uh, was because of this overwhelming amount of, of, of potential units, potential, <laughs> which we want. We want an overwhelming amount of supply. So um, when we had those thresholds put on uh, relating to population bases, especially in, in some of the larger counties, there was the contiguous, what they call a contiguous within the GMA, the UGA, this boundary line, and it would pick up some of these smaller communities. And those smaller communities did not want to fit within that. They felt that it should be underneath the aspect of the, of the thresholds of 75,000 population or 25,000, which would limit what could be put on those lots. So ultimately, I believe uh, the striker as it put together did address that. And so uh, you see a, um, a not as 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 much opportunity to put in, uh, say, a fourplex or sixplex, but limiting what can be put uh, on any given lot within the thresholds of the population. So it still will have an effect, and especially in some communities where um, you know they want that and or are already working towards that. Um, and it does work in conjunction with the other ones. I I think that one of the key pieces on this is it did not pick up the affordability pieces like the Transitory Development Bill uh, that came out of the Senate 40 to seven. And by the time it got to the House, uh, became a affordable housing bill, um, which pretty much eliminated uh, the incentives for private sector to develop within those transitory uh, districts. Um, now we're trying to work that backwards and, and align it with the middle housing bill, uh, which hopefully we'll, we'll get there with that. But um, that's that's really the biggest thing. And I think those thresholds, when, when you looked at the original bills, you know, it was very broad and the thresholds were high, the, the, the city limits were, the, the population were very low. And over time, those dials got dialed up to where um, it restricted, you know, where this can actually be implemented. Yeah, I would just add um, one of the things, you know, we you know, noticed the add the change in ways and means what not maybe not everybody added is we actually defeated, I think, five amendments that would have made the bill useless. So yeah. I think there's still effort on both sides to try to make this do something useful and build more housing. And it's it's going to be, you know, the legislative process is sometimes messy, but we're going to get there. Did you have a follow up, Laura? Yeah, um, on another question on um, abortion, specifically the shield law, I guess I'm wondering, I know you've mentioned, you know, there isn't, you feel that there's no point in, you know, expanding access in Washington, as you said, it's law, but I mean, why not work to kind of protect people who might come from Idaho, for example, where they just, you know, pass that trafficking um, bill, I don't know how much you know about that, but I guess, Specifically, your thoughts on the shield law um, proposal this session? You know, Laurel, candidly, I don't know a lot about the shield law. This is fairly new. Uh, if you're talking about the the uh, announcement this afternoon, I, I just not that familiar with it. But I, I'd say the same thing again. Um, we're not getting a clamoring from our constituents that this is the most important issue. I'm not saying it's not an important issue and it doesn't deserve attention. It's just as, as you spend your time here in Olympia, uh, we want to get be as responsive as we can to the people, what the people in our districts are asking for. And this isn't something that's the top of their mind, that they feel like they have the access that they have voted into law uh, decades ago now. And that this, this isn't it's it's just not their top issue. I'm not saying it's like I said, it's not this not an important issue. It's just not their top issue. Do you have anything else, Laurel? Or? Uh, no, I'm okay. Thanks. Okay. Next, we will go to uh, Claire Withercombe of the Seattle Times. Hi, good morning. Um, I spoke with Senator Brown about this yesterday, but I'm interested in opening it up to the group. Uh, Bill dropped yesterday um, what's described as an excise tax on the compensation of highly paid hospital employees. I think the bill number is 5767. Just curious um, about kind of Republicans' views on this, you know, kind of late in session. Is this a messaging bill? Uh, is there a serious chance that this will get uh, considered? Thank you. Well, I think it's absolutely a messaging bill. And the message is, uh, if you're part of a group that, uh, 
some legislator doesn't like the floodgates are wide open now for them to go after you uh, by naming naming your organization, naming your group and calling it an excise tax. Senator Brown? Or... Uh, ditto. I think JT nailed it. I mean... uh, did you have a follow-up, Claire? Uh, I don't think so, but I imagine you are kind of talking about kind of the post- Quinn capital gains tax context there. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next question comes from uh, Brett Davis from the Center Square via um, email, and it's along the uh, similar lines as the the last question. Um, but he says, "I see Senate Bill fifty seven sixty seven funding healthcare access by imposing an excise tax on the annual compensation paid to certain highly compensated hospital employees has been introduced following the state Supreme Court's decision that an excise tax could be applied to income. Given said decision, do you think this will be the first of many excise taxes on income introduced in Washington? I'll expand yeah. a little bit on what I said, perhaps. Um, you know this this is such a a worrisome phenomenon now it's not just about taxes it's about the idea that uh you know you demonize a group and you use the legislature to go after them uh and uh, if anybody thinks that they won't be part of some unpopular group sometime they should think again uh the idea um of using legislation to attack individual groups, small groups of people is is just so corrosive. Uh, I, I hope that this is the last effort like this that we see, but we should all be concerned that it's the first. Yeah, I don't think there's a lot to add there. We, we saw efforts to, you know, bills even uh, before the recent ruling by the state Supreme Court uh, but after the passage of the capital gains tax in 2021 to to increase the rate to to you know drop down the exemption to broaden the tax and and we've been saying all along that if they get the ruling that they ultimately got that uh, this is going to be a gateway to additional taxes on a whole uh, realm of, of of organizations and people around our state and I don't think I think this this bill while is probably a message given that it's we're in we have less than three weeks left in the session. Uh, is an indication of where people are going to go uh, when they either are, as JT said, you know, have concerns about a particular organization or they just need to find extra money to do uh, something else with. I mean, it, it's just uh, going to open up a whole new realm. I would be shocked if when we come back into session next year, we don't have a, a, a myriad of, of different excise tax bills that go after different organizations and and different groups of people all for for perhaps noteworthy causes but not done in a way that is i think in keeping with our constitution uh or uh, in a way that's fair and balanced and, and helps get after the uh, and you're, you're going to sound repetitive here but get after the key issues that we're focused on and what people don't seem to always understand is when you raise taxes on one group of folks in our state uh, one of two things happen. Those groups, those folks either leave the state, in which case they don't pay the taxes, or they find a way to pass those costs on to others in the state and ultimately make the, you know, the cost of living here in the state of Washington higher. Uh, that's how it plays out. And, and uh, we've seen this, and, and yet the, the majority insists on dropping new and innovative new taxes, especially under the new ruling from the state Supreme Court. I use the term innovative very loosely there. Uh, for the reporters still on, um, do you have any more questions? Okay. If not, uh, in the time that we have left, uh, let's turn it over to the ranking members of the House and Senate Transportation Committees respectively uh, for them to weigh in on their thoughts on the transportation budget. And uh, we will start with um, Representative Barkas. Um, you can tell us a little bit about what happened on the House floor last night. 
Uh, thank you, John. Uh, well, on the House floor, we passed uh, the House Transportation Budget 96 to 1 with one excuse. So uh, I don't think it gets more bipartisan than that. Um, very proud of the work that we did. And I think as Senator Braun and Senator and uh, Representative Wilcox alluded to, uh, not the same case with the operating budget. Uh, so it is it is absolutely reflected this year of being back in the room together after a couple of hard years. Uh, I think Senator King will agree um, in trying to work through the budget and the move ahead package. Uh, this bill, I'm confident, uh, does a good job in correcting what we saw coming out of the governor's office uh, at the beginning of session, and that is a um, very concerning <clears throat> move of critical infrastructure projects from the Connecting Washington uh, package uh, way out into the future, uh, the rephasing, uh, reappropriations, et cetera. Uh, we work diligently to work within the confines of uh, the resources that we have. Uh, to be able to bring those uh, back forward, phase them in appropriately uh, based on uh, realistic expectations of when they could be completed. Um, using the reappropriations and existing bond capacity, uh, we found the resources to do that. And uh, that's reflected in the Gateway Project, the North-South Freeway in Spokane, et cetera. Um, in addition to that, we also uh, funded our state patrol um, additional classes, we're still 254 troopers down. Uh, we have a, a huge issue there. And so the biggest thing is also looking at lateral classes, trying to attract other law enforcement uh, professionals from around the country and the state uh, to join the state patrol with uh, using incentives um, and a different uh, methodology by which to be uh, become a trooper. Uh, maintenance and preservation, um, big investments there. The ferry boats, um, we did work a lot within the system to work on workforce development. On the capital side, of course, we still have an issue in getting these new ferries built. Uh, these delays have cost the state of Washington hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, so we have been working in cooperation uh, with the Senate on a procurement bill, which is going to open up the procurement process uh, more uh, widely. Uh, and hopefully get uh, some competitive bids quickly so we can get at uh, building those. And I, I would say lastly, one of the key components in here, and I'm sure Senator King will, will expand on this, it was very difficult to see the amount of money that was lost, the, the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars that we had to put into projects to cover the, the delays and the additional expenses that were occur, incurred throughout the state for a myriad of reasons. Uh, but the it was very concerning that we're not delivering these projects in a timely manner. That money that we had to reappropriate could have been used on a, on a lot of other stuff that is much needed in the state. Um, at the end of the day, I'm looking forward to, I think the Senate also has a very good budget. And uh, we start, I think uh, this week, Senator, or soon, uh, to mm -hmm. uh, reconcile those two into a, a product that we can um, be proud of here in the state of Washington. So Senator King, you want to add on that? <clears throat> well, if I may, thank you, uh, Andrew. And uh, uh, I, I do believe that uh, the House has a good budget. Uh, uh, I also believe that the Senate has a good budget, but that's what makes this uh, always interesting. But uh, yeah, we the governor, the governor moved... Uh, Geez, I don't know what he did move out to uh, 2031 or 2039 or whenever it was. Uh, but, uh, I mean, unbelievable that you could take uh, the North-South Freeway as an example and say, oh, well, we're going to postpone that for six years. Uh, it had already been postponed for like 35. So, I mean, let's, <clears throat> at some point, you got to get real and you got to work on getting things done. That's what I believe we tried to do in the Senate. I think uh, the House did similar things. Uh, I think the main difference uh, has to do with the length of, I think the House tried to balance with, with a two-year look outlook, and we tried to balance with a six-year outlook. You know, those are the, those are the things that make, uh, I think, our lives interesting and, and will bring us together as we try to negotiate these two budgets. Uh, as as uh, the good representative said, we got a real problem with our ferries, um, and and uh, for once we're trying to 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 maybe look at well maybe we can buy one of these or two or three of these ferries outside of the state of Washington, 
Uh, believe me, uh, that's that's getting all kinds of uh, interesting comments, good, bad, and indifferent. But it's been it's been something that uh, we should have looked at a long time ago. Not not necessarily necessarily saying that our our uh, uh, ferry contractors can't be competitive, but we don't know because we've never had the opportunity to see what's out there and what a, what another ferry from uh, California or Louisiana or somewhere would cost us. So um, we we got to work on ferries. We got to work on our ferry system. Uh, we're doing a lot uh, trying to uh, allow those in the ferry system to try and find employees that have been uh, either retired or left because they weren't vaccinated or a variety of things caused us a real problem. Uh, I mean, we're missing sailings. We've cut our sailings back. Uh, I, I feel for all the people that have to ride uh, the ferry system and may not have any other choices. Uh, we we tried uh, very hard to look at uh, all of the ramifications within transportation, find some common ground, and and <clears throat> we voted uh, our budget, the Senate budget, out of uh, 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 labor and commerce, labor and commerce, out of transportation. I I believe yesterday uh, had a good vote, uh, twelve yeas and two without recommendation. Uh, we also passed a bond bill out and a tolling bill uh, that had to do with allowing tolling on uh, the, the new I-5 bridge that's being proposed. Uh, and it comes with a lot of ramifications and sideboards around it, which I think is which is a good thing. Uh, but I'm looking forward to uh, sitting across the table from uh, Chair Fai and Representative Barkas and, and trying to craft a... Uh, a transportation budget that's going to meet the needs of this state uh, at least for the next two years and hopefully work on the next four to six. All right, with that, we will go to uh, closing remarks and we'll start with uh, Senator Brown. All right, thanks, John. I'll be brief. I, I appreciate everyone being here today. As I said earlier, we got under three weeks left. We're going to stay focused on the things that we think are uh, uh, people are telling us are the most important in their lives to make the, their 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 families, their communities uh, better, our state better, public safety, affordability, education. Have a good day. Bye. Representative Wilcox. Well, thanks again, everybody, for being here. Uh, we've got uh, great House and Senate Republican teams that are working hard to make the last three weeks count. And uh, in uh, spite of the rough spots, uh, uh, we've got a bunch of people in the other caucuses that are here to uh, serve the state of Washington as well. And uh, I just want us to make the next three weeks as productive as possible. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you again next week.